welcome back, everybody, and welcome to the second day and sadly the last day of Drive. I'm Jennifer McCormick, and I will be introducing Ashutos Nandeshwar. I just want to again thank Chris Sorison and his incredible team for organizing this, and I want to have everybody give a rousing round of applause. I was very fortunate to um, be working with Chris. I work with Chris at the University of Washington, and weekly Chris was coming up to me telling me all the numbers of great speakers that were coming in, and it was just really exciting, and also the number of attendees. And I don't know if, most of you probably don't know, but this year, uh, the number of attendees, both here sitting physically and also virtually, um, surpassed the number of attendees for the past three years of Drive, which is incredible and is a testimony, right? <laughs> to how thirsty we, re we all are for getting together and engaging in these conversations around data and analytics. So my job today as an introducer, I think is really hard. I think it's harder than the keynotes because um, we're kind of stressing over getting this right. And I know Heather and Michael, my co-introducers can, can say this. And of course, they stole some great things, you know, the power stance or the improvising and throwing away the papers. I've got to be old school. I've got my papers here to get it right for Ashutosh. Um, so let's just start. Um, I've known Ashutosh for a few years, and I really am a big fan of both his work and his intellect. And um, one of the things about Ashutosh that really always impresses me is his focus, his advocacy for critical thinking in the work that we do, and not focusing, not being led down the road by different techniques and tools but really emphasizing the questions that we ask. And this is really kind of what Ray Ghani was talking about this morning, not chasing the shiny things. And I want to quote um, Ashutosh, what something he wrote about a year ago about the analyst. And if I can get this in my notes, otherwise I will have to improvise. He, wrote, he says, the analyst will first ask why, rather than asking how. And after seeing the results, we'll ask, so what? And I think this is the message that we have to all take back again and again, and Ashutosh will be talking about this. A little bit about Ashutosh. He's the Director of Prospect Development and Analytics at Caltech. He earned his PhD in machine learning and enjoys speaking about the power of data and is one of the few analytics professionals in the higher education industry who has developed analytic solutions for all stages of the student life cycle. But that's not why we invited him here today. He's also very picky about his charts and loves to talk about them. He also wrote a book about charts and data visualization with Tableau, but that's not why we invited him here today. He also enjoys ranting about data professionals who chase after interesting things, shiny objects. But as you might have guessed, this is not why we invited him here today. Imagine your life hanging by just a couple of spoken words. Our speaker was transformed by such a few words. And in the next hour, you will learn about these experiences that shaped him and brought him here, and how you can also benefit from these principles and that can help make you successful. Without further ado, and it's my pleasure to introduce Ashtosh Nandeshwar. Do you feel your elementary school days were just yesterday? <laughs> I see a very few nods. Maybe I should listen to my wife once in a while. I should let the eight-year-old in me grow up. Well then, I won't tell you how I spilled food on myself this week. <laughs> Instead, I want you to come back with me to my fifth grade classroom. The school bell just rang. All the kids rushed to their classrooms. The teacher walked towards the squeaky platform, sat on her old wooden chair, put on her thick eyeglasses, and started taking attendance. All the kids were still yawning, and then she called out, Nandeshwar! Completely surprised, I blurted out, I am absent! Needless to say, the whole class was rolling on the floor. I wanted to say I was absent yesterday. 
But I didn't know how to say something like that. English was completely new to me. Even to this day, I struggle with it. For example, when I want to say deep, I say dip. When I want to say sheep, I say ship. And when I want to say worksheet, it becomes work. <laughs> it is only my spicy accents that I get a gate free out of gel card. <laughs> you know, today I can laugh about such things. But it wasn't so while growing up. Not only did I struggle in school, but I also had a huge disadvantage. Jennifer, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Chris, thank you for giving me this fantastic opportunity to speak to this amazing crowd. And I thank Chris and the whole Drive team for organizing such a fantastic conference. What do you think? Yeah. Friends, thank you for joining me today. It is an honor to be speaking with you. In the next 35 minutes, you will learn about the three methods that have helped, helped me overcome my disadvantages. And I'm optimistic and confident if you follow these three simple methods, you will grow faster and will be quite successful. What is your caste? Ask my fair, only if in complexion, teacher. I froze instantly as all the eyes in the sixth grade classroom pierced through me. Although it is illegal to ask someone's caste as it leads to discrimination in India, do you know why she asked me that question? I had written an excellent essay in Marathi, a pure language supposedly can only be better spoken by upper castes. And I, after all, did not even belong to the caste system. I was just an untouchable, devoid of any intelligence. Amy Curry, a famous Harvard Business School professor, in her TED talk provided evidence how even standing for two minutes in a power pose increases your testosterone and decreases your cortisol, thus making you feel powerful, confident, and assertive. And unfortunately, the reverse is true as well. If you are told all your life that you lack talent, your brain starts reacting to it, thus making you feel less confident and less assertive. And those are the factors that affect one's chances of success. I learned then it wasn't enough to produce something of quality as I never was going to be enough for the society. Whether it is going to school, admitting to college, or getting a job, until this day, I get to hear how I and others like me lack talent. That we take advantage of the benefits and unworthy of any education or job. In this gray world, merit is completely binary. Either you are smart or you are a failure. Perhaps I was absent. Until one afternoon, my older brother asked me to sit on his bicycle and took me to his friend's place. Now his friend was important, for he had an impressive collection of stamps. And there, as older brothers often do, he taught me. He taught me misdirection. And suddenly, I had a huge collection of stamps. <laughs> I thought to myself, hmm, this is an easy way out of many problems. Build an empire out of stolen stamps. <laughs> Fortunately, my dream was broken soon. Later, he gave me a better gift, a book. A book full of quotations. Quotations from various successful people, such as Andrew Carnegie's, do not look for approval except for the consciousness of doing your best. Or Napoleon Hill's strength and growth only come through continuous effort and struggle. I suddenly felt profound. I was free at last. For the first time in my life, I understood that I did not need to care 
for what others thought of me or what labels they stuck on me. And that confidence is not given. Confidence is cultivated. I realize the one and the only thing required for success was hunger. Hunger to learn, hunger to improve, and hunger to succeed. After all, education is expensive, but knowledge is free. And to help spread that knowledge, we have three books here to give away. After this talk, the Drive team will be distributing these books. And even if you don't win one of those books, I have a free gift for you. While you walk outside, you can pick one of those. Carol Dweck, in her book, Mindset, talks about how placing labels creates a fixed mindset that lets people believe that their talents and intelligence are somehow fixed. Their lives go on finding evidence and supporting those beliefs, but they don't develop themselves further. Whereas the growth mindset says, no matter how much talent you have, you can always develop it with effort. Yes, it requires a lot of effort and patience, but don't you think it's amazing? That it empowers you to know that you can grow beyond the artificial limits. To help expand my knowledge, I decided to attend a graduate school in the United States. I was very excited to move to this country and experience what it's known for, its largeness. So I left the city with 2.5 million people and moved to West Virginia. <laughs> Not exactly the largeness I had in my mind. We were lucky though in Morgantown to experience exotic places such as Taco Bell <laughs> and Office Max and rich traditions such as burning couches. I was so surprised to see the whole Seattle city intact after that interception in the Super Bowl. <laughs> it was my first semester. One late chilly fall night, my friend and I were at the ultimate nightclub for graduate students, the library. <laughs> Raise your hands if you remember long nights at the library. It was one of those nights. He and I had just started working on an assignment and we were collecting more material. And just then, we noticed our classmate walk by with a backpack on his back and the completed assignment in his hand. Surprised that he finished his assignment so quickly, we stopped him and asked him, hey, how did you finish your assignment so quickly? He looked at us and said, what are you doing? We said, we are trying to collect more material and try to understand and learn this topic. He looked at us and said, <laughs> that is the problem. Your time will be better spent if you just finish the assignment and not worry about learning. I wish you were there to see our expressions. <laughs> we were shocked. How could this be? How could he take learning so lightly? Yes, you probably know a few people who have climbed up the ladder by using just a few buzzwords. But when people find out the truth, there is no place to go. All the years of experience, all the goodwill is gone, poof. Robert Greene, in his book Mastery, warns that we become slaves to time. As it passes, we grow weaker less capable, and trapped in some dead-end career. I believe a better strategy, just as my grandmother would say, is to have substance than be shiny. Some of my fondest memories from my childhood are with my grandmother. She was barely educated, her husband died young, she used to walk more than four miles to make enough money just to survive. And although she was spelled with the double curse of being an untouchable and a woman, 
She raised four, five kids by herself. She would collect all the kids who otherwise would not go to school, nor were welcome in school, and teach them arts as a vocational skill. And I'm sure she was young at some point of time, as we all are. But in my mind, she's the loving lady with tired knees and the wrinkled skin. She used to take the city bus across the town just to meet with us. And every time she did, she brought a box filled with her homemade delicious food. And I'm sure my mother must have been quite mad at us as we would finish even the vegetables that she would bring and leave my mother's chicken curry alone. She's the most self-reliant, disciplined, and principled person I have ever met. As we would gather with all the excitement, I used to tell her, Grandma, Grandma, please tell us some stories. And she usually did. Now for me, you see, she never was separate from those stories. She was a walking, talking example of the culmination of those stories. One day, she told me such a story and ended with her usual one-liners. She said, Uthar panela kharkhat far. Which means, boy, don't you ever throw the ball when you are one yard away from winning the Super Bowl. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to get that out of me. I was rooting for Seahawks. She said, Uthar panela kharkhat far, which means streaming shallow water always makes a lot of noise. But when the water is deep, it is silent. Then she asked me, grow big, but be deep like the sea. And I pass the same message to you, improve yourself by learning a skill, but be deep like the sea and not like the streaming shallow water. At the end, as Paul Arden said, it's not how good you are, it's how good you want to be. And good, you can become with the second method for success, and that is practice. Practice to master. It's one thing to learn about something, and yet another to put that into practice. In recent years, I have learned a lot about diet and exercise, but as you can see, I have not put that much into practice. One evening, I was sitting on the recliner in my living room with my five-year-old. Now raise your hand if children have brought you back from your dreamland to the reality. <laughs> we were flipping through a few pages from the National Geographic magazine, and we noticed a picture of a pregnant woman. I explained it to him, why the belly of that woman was so big. He reflected upon my answer. And with the most innocent tones only kids can have, he said, Dad, it looks like you have a baby in your belly. <laughs> <laughs> now don't feel bad for me. I sent him to his room for a 15-minute timeout. <laughs> and when he came back, I asked him to do 15 crunches <laughs> while I had some ice cream. After that, he looked quite fit. <laughs> if you don't practice what you learn, you don't get what you earn, as I soon found out. Do you remember the excitement of getting something you have always wanted? You had been keeping an eye on it, doing your homework, and you finally get your box from Amazon. <laughs> Maybe it's the new Windows phone. Nope, sorry Microsoft, nobody wants that. Maybe it's the new coach bag you have always wanted. Do you remember that excitement of opening that box? Now multiply that excitement by 10,000. That is how excited I was to get my first managerial job. It was the perfect job. If I can write complex code, managing people should be easy, right? <laughs> Boy, did I learn how wrong I was very soon. Although in this job, I tried to think of the growth of the team and the individuals. 
one employee wanted to grow at a much faster rate than I could approve of. While I tried to empathize and relate, this employee wanted the paycheck to inflate. I struggled to explain that life is not about hitting off check boxes and getting promoted. That learning concepts deeply and applying them to unseen problems was important too. In my mind, I wanted to change this employee's mindset. But in reality, I struggled to change my managerial style. Ultimately, I fail. One afternoon, this employee walked into my office and said, I have an offer, and handed me a freshly printed colored copy of an offer letter. Now, I don't know how your printers are set up, but back then, to take a color printout, you had to go out of your way. <laughs> and this color somehow symbolized this person's victory. Do you know why I failed? Well, quite simply, I was overconfident that I knew everything about managing people. I learned that knowing something is hardly enough, but practicing hard secures the knowing. One of the best compliments you can receive as a speaker is someone walking to you and saying, hey, you're a natural. Why, you say? Well, there is nothing gifted or innate about speaking. You heard Scott Adams yesterday when he said people can become good speakers. In his very popular book, Confessions of a Public Speaker, Scott Birkin says, no matter how much you hate or love this book, you are unlikely to become a good public speaker. So much promise for a book on speaking. He goes on further to say, there will always be shortage of good public speakers in this world, no matter how many great books are written on this topic. Speaking is a performance skill, and performance means practice. That was a eureka moment for me. If there is a shortage, and if people don't practice, even I had a shot at this, even I, who could not even say a few sentences in English. Even I, who was ridiculed, had a shot at this. Here's further proof what training could do. Department of Education recently found out that in New York City, the gifted education programs have disproportionately been represented by white children and Asian American children. They found out that their chances, African-American children and Hispanic children, their chances into getting such programs have gone down even further. In New York City, although African-American children and Hispanic children outnumber the white children and Asian children, they are hardly in these programs. And they have provided hard numbers, but this is how I understood it. Let's say this gifted program was a pie, apple pie maybe, with 10 slices, and we have 10 children, two Asian American children would get to eat three slices. Two white children would get to eat four slices. And three African American children, 1.5. And four Hispanic children, only one slice. Gifted? or trained? What do you think? Here's further proof. The state of North Carolina initiated a project called Project Bright Idea. In this project, they trained teachers to treat every child as if they were gifted. And these children had never been nominated for any gifted programs. But in one short year, one short year, what they found is nothing short of remarkable. 25% of these children who were never nominated for any gifted programs in one short year were identified as gifted. Don't you think that's amazing? Well, you too are gifted. But we spend more than five hours every day on Facebook and TV. 
and compare that to mere 30 minutes we devote to reading. Imagine the improvement we will see if you spend five hours on reading, learning, and thinking. Robert Greene says, if all of us are born with a similar brain configuration and similar potential for mastery, why is it in history that very few people have truly mastered their potential? He goes on further to say that high IQ and talent cannot predict future success. It is practice and immersion that can make one successful. The basic premise behind deliberate practice is quite simple. You isolate the specific aspects of what you want to improve, and you practice until you improve that. And you get immediate feedback. Two things are must for deliberate practice. You should be able to create small chunks and get immediate feedback. It is for a reason Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence is therefore not an act, but a habit. Or as the other famous philosopher, 50 Cent said, get rich or die trying. <laughs> of course, you must be thinking, if it only took learning and practicing, anyone could succeed. Well, not everyone wants to learn something new or practice for a long periods of time. But yes, there is another fact and that is opportunity. Now, if my kids were here, they would say, Dad, stop embarrassing us. You don't even know how to say opportunity. <laughs> and this is an important word, so I want to make sure that you understand what I'm saying. A chance, a happenstance, a juncture of favorable circumstances. Opportunity. I have been fortunate receive some opportunities. You may know graduate school is long and stressful. Even more stressful is a married couple of graduate students. <laughs> and as a couple of graduate students sometimes find out, we found out that we had bills to pay. Although we didn't live on ramen, I remember the testing times. One afternoon, in, an, in my attempts to cook something, I took half of an onion, half of an onion, and started dicing. And then I heard my wife's thunder, hey! At that rate, you'll finish that onion in just one meal. We have one full week to go. Are you sure you're going to graduate school? How did they even admit you? Nothing was a more of a stark reminder of the testing times than her and I walking to the bursar's office and looking at the billing statement. $8,000 only. As every sensible graduate student would do in such a situation, I handed the employee my credit card. He stared at me for a good seven seconds and with one swipe sent me swirling down the gigantic hole of debt. A few days passed by, and as couples sometimes find, find out, we found out that we were expecting our first child. Now, I have not experienced a heart attack yet, <laughs> but what I felt that day was very close to a heart attack. Now, I had to find a job very quickly, so I did a lot of dicing, career building, and monstering. And finally, I got a call for an interview. After the day long interviews were over, over I met one of the kindest men you'll ever meet. So he asked me, so why are you interested in this position? And although I knew better how to answer this question, I thought since he's kind, I will tell him about my situation. While driving back, I said to myself, well done Ashutosh, you are so stupid. Are you sure you are going to the graduate school? How did they even admit you? 
I forgot about the job interview a few days passed by, and when I wasn't dicing nor crying, I heard my phone ring. I answered. It was the kind hiring manager. He said, I have a good news for you. Then not only did he offer me this job, he offered the salary I had quoted. That stupid me to put my salary in the application. Then he said, I thought of you and your situation. I had other candidates as well. But I thought to myself, why not you? Why not give you a hand when you need it the most? Then not only did he give me his hand, he gave me his heart. For the next few years, he coached me, trained me, and most importantly, he taught me how to make most of the opportunities. Of course, this would not have happened had I not received another opportunity right before this. About 14 years ago, on an unusually wintry day, in my home city of Nagpur, I was in my room, bundled up and pounding away at my keyboard. And just then, I noticed my slightly hunched father took snail-like steps and had an envelope in his hand. And he said, don't be sad, son, but I have a bad news for you. That he said something like that was huge. After all, he had barely recovered from his near fatal injuries that he suffered through just a few months ago. It was pouring down, raining, when he was found lying on the street for more than three hours. With a cut on his skull, like the first cut on a watermelon. He kept lying on the street while bypassers mistook him for a drunk. He stayed there for three hours, and eventually he was taken to the hospital, where he was admitted to the ICU. And he laid in coma for three days. And after he woke up and began his recovery, we found out they had, he had lost his ability to name things correctly. He would chuckle whenever he would call telephone a toilet. I'm sure he smiled when he couldn't say wife. But I know he cried when he couldn't say our names right. Back in my room, he handed me the open letter. And to my dismay, it was yet another rejection letter from graduate schools in the United States. In fact, it was my last rejection letter. 100% rejections, even from my safety schools. By that time, I had even gotten used to the American way of saying no without insulting you. <laughs> my heart sank, and as I slouched in my chair, what my father said after that has changed everything. Although he had gone through such trauma and was unsure of his income and job, friends, I want you to listen to what he said. Don't worry about the money, son. Go take the best coaching classes that will prepare you for a successful admissions application. Now, I'm sure it took him more than 40 minutes to say that, but I had to shorten it for you. I didn't know whether to cry or smile. I didn't know whether it would be right of me to think of myself and access such a generous gift while he still was recovering. I didn't know whether he could afford such expensive classes along with his medical bills. I did know one thing, however. While others would ridicule me, he gave me another chance, another opportunity at getting good education. But nobody taught me better than how to make most of the opportunities than my dog. That's true. When I was about 10 years old, my older brother had found him on the streets. It was an Indian native dog, 
with a beautiful golden coat and with the most loving eyes. As the youngest of three brothers, I got beat up quite often. And then I would go and complain to the dog and he would just stare at me. <laughs> Raise your hands if you remember the TV show, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. For those who don't know, there was a prince and a meek cat. And the powers vested in his sword, he transforms himself into He-Man, the most powerful man on the earth, and a battle cat. Well, whenever I would be sad, I would point, take out my sword, point at him, and say, I have the power! And sit on him and pull his ears slightly. <laughs> As he howls, and we both transform to He-Man and the battle cat. <laughs> that dog was my best friend. He did all the giving, however. One day, we found out that he had some serious infection that we had overlooked. My father was extremely mad that we brought a living thing in our house and did not even take care of it. The vet said that he needed to be put down so that he wouldn't follow them. My brother and father took him far, far away from the house and gave him his fatal pills and left him alone. After a few hours, I came back from school and went to the room where he usually would be. And I was shocked. I saw him curled up under the bed at his usual place. Somehow, he found home and came back. Even in his death, he still gave. Although we had failed to take care of him, he did not fail to take care of us. Although we had left him alone there to die, he knew where he belonged. And although we didn't give him proper opportunities, he made the most of the opportunities that he got to live with us. Friends, whether you sought or are given an opportunity, make the most of the opportunity as if that's the only opportunity you will ever receive. What if one person is told all her life that she lacks talent? What do you think she will do? To be able to practice, one needs the opportunity to do so. You have been given such an opportunity. You are sitting on it. Not everyone is as lucky as you to attend the DRIVE conference. What is the most exciting thing you learn here at DRIVE? What is that you cannot wait to go back and implement? For me, it's the astronaut saying, live your life in three dimensions. Go help other human beings. Or Don Lepore saying, amazing things happen when you tell people, I believe in you. I got your back. Or Scott Adams saying, create systems. Find your own luck. Or all the analytical solutions that I saw from Memorial Sloan Catering and University of Chicago. Have you been ever told that you lack talent? Have you been ever told that you're not worth anything? Have you been ever told that you're incapable of something? Well, then today is the day you tell yourself that labels people give you do not define you. Confidence is not given. Confidence is cultivated. There are two 95 days left in this year. In these next two 95 days, I want to challenge you to learn what you want to become, practice the skills to master them, and find and make most of the opportunities. As Alexander Graham Bell said, the only difference between success and failure is the ability to take action. When I see you next year, I want you to tell me which action you took to make yourself successful. If you are still thinking about which skill to pick up, as you heard from Scott Adams yesterday, speaking is definitely in our advantage. I think the biggest obstacle for technical folks like me and you is selling our point of view. 
Every conversation is about selling. Whether it is convincing your children to buy a knockoff iPhone, <laughs> or failing to convince your significant other not to throw your awesome computer cable collection. <laughs> Maybe that's just me. But learn, practice, and find opportunities and make the most out of them. And communicate better. If I can do it, you can do it too. I was here. I was absent. But today, I am present. And I'm here. So much so that my first grader is living in a different reality. He was asked a question too. On MLK Day, his teacher asked him, what is your dream? With the optimism only first graders can have, he said, my dream is to one day drink wine. <laughs> I had to ask him, are you sure you're going to the elementary school? How did they even admit you? <laughs> Let's wrap this talk by remembering India's greatest civil rights leader and one of the greatest minds, Dr. Ambedkar. He said, unlike a drop of water which loses its identity when it joins the ocean, a man does not lose his being in the society. He's born not for the development of the society alone, but for the development of his self. Cultivation of mind should be the ultimate aim of human existence. Friends, cultivate your mind, drive further. Thank you. <laughs>